Rasmussen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, say dial in, uh, go webinar into uh, this session, the infinite game of managing risk. Uh, really, really exciting um, presentation, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, and thanks very much to Glenn. Uh, I'll say a man who needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Uh, Glenn, I've known for many years. He is an award-winning risk uh, and safety consultant uh, who's worked all over the world um, and someone who I have the, the utmost respect for. Uh, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to hearing what Glenn has to share with us this evening. Uh, before I hand over to Glenn, though, a couple of updates uh, from the branch. Uh, this is the East Anglia branches second webinar since relaunching just before the end of the last calendar year uh, and we also have another two sessions in the bag which uh, we'll be able to be booked on to soon if not already that for next one being on the 21st of february which is a focus on machinery safety and the 29th of march which is going to focus on fire risk and a bit of a legislation update for people in that space uh, another reminder of across all of IIRSM is the closing date for the Risk Excellence Awards is coming up at the 3rd of February. So if you have an opportunity to nominate an individual or a team for one of the range of awards from the Risk Excellence Award categories, then uh, please take the time out. It's a very simple application process. It's free to enter. And uh, our very own Glenn Ridsdale is uh, lucky to be one of the judging panelists uh, again. So uh, all applications will cross over his desk at some point, I'm sure. But so that is uh, enough from me. Uh, I'll hand over to, to Glenn, the man who needs no introduction. Um, thanks again for, for running through this. I'll hand the, uh, the floor over to you, Glenn. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And, uh... Again, thank you to Julie and the uh, the rest of the East Anglia <coughs> branch for for facilitating this webinar. Um, I know these things don't happen by themselves and they do take a lot of effort. So well done for organising it and thank you very much for the invite um, and for the kind words as well. Um, and before I forget, good luck to anybody who is entering the awards this year. Um, uh, I wish you all the best and uh, we'll see what comes out of the... Uh, the categories this year looking forward to that so yeah my, my name's glenn glenn ridsdale uh, very quickly about me um i'm the managing director of gauge solutions um gauge solutions um we operate um pretty much all over the world now we we deliver all aspects of risk and performance management training and consultancy work um to a to an array of clients on a global basis um, but again, this isn't really about us or Gage Solutions. It's about <coughs> what we're here to do today. If you want further information on what we're about, the details are all there at the end. So the infinite game of managing risk. Well, a couple of things just to sort of give you forewarning about today. Some of the slides, I have made them um, quite text heavy. That's, that's quite deliberate. I'm not intending to read every word on the slides. Um, I just thought that after the webinar, people might be inclined to want some further information. So I've spoken with, with Julie and Jonathan, who are obviously facilitating the session today, and they've assured me that these slides um, will be delivered for those who want them in PDF format. So if, you're, if you are keen and you want to pursue this concept further, um, that's going to be available for you to do so. That's the first thing. The second thing, I don't know how many people on the call um, have English as their first language, um, but I want to make it quite clear. Nobody is suggesting that managing risk is a game. Um, the infinite game of managing risk is just, um, it's just, a, if you like, a, a catchphrase with regards to some things we're going to be covering. So for those on the call who don't quite grasp what that means think of it as a mindset so it's the infinite mindset of managing risk 
measuring performance and alternative sort of perspective. So um, that's a little bit of context to set the scene for the actual, for the webinar itself. So the session is going to cover um, predominantly monit monitoring risk expectations and guidance, um, HSE corporate governance. So as much as the webinar will be based on risk, I've done this with a, with a health, safety and environmental bias. But for all that we're talking about HSE, this could well be finance or any other aspect of, aspect of risk. And it's looking at applying this infinite mindset to that. But that'll become apparent as we go through the webinar. We'll be looking at traditional risk metrics versus some thoughts on thinking differently. And at this point, all I would ask everyone to do is to keep a very open mind with regards to some of the things I'm going to be suggesting. We'll be looking at the, the concept of Vision Zero and how this, over many, many, many years, has, has really become a, a philosophy, an aspiration, sometimes an obsession. But we're going to be looking at um, a couple of case studies, findings and examples as to whether or not Vision Zero is actually healthy for an organisation. So that will give us the context about today's webinar. Then we'll be actually moving into what the, the finite and infinite game actually is and covering some of the key concepts. Looking at how do we build an infinite mindset type of a culture within our organisations. Knowing what to measure in the infinite game. And then we'll be finishing today's webinar with some, hopefully, some good takeaway messages for you guys to consider implementation. And then any recommendations for future consideration as well. So that's the basis of what the session will cover. So if we start with, in terms of measurement and what we mean by monitoring, insurance and governance, one of the most appropriate places to start really, certainly for, the, for those in the UK, would be what, what's the perspective from our regulator? And what, what they expect is that we're checking that we're managing risks in our organisation, and that is a vital concept. It provides you assurance that you are managing health and safety risks and affords opportunities for improvement. An approach to monitor your health and safety performance, it should be similar as to how other aspects are measured within an organisation. For example, if you look at a profit and loss account, a business doesn't simply review how much money they spend, monthly, quarterly, yearly, they want to understand where that money is being spent and why. So it's not just looking at what's happened, it's understanding why it's happened. Good quality monitoring will not just depend on identifying problems, but it will help you understand what caused them and the sort of changes that are needed to address them. But the, the most important thing for, from this slide for me that I took away was poor monitoring might tell you that something is wrong or it isn't useful in helping you understand why or what to do about it. And then underneath there, you can see some, some basic principles about what good monitoring looks like. Checking your performance against a range of predetermined measures is one of the most frequently used techniques of monitoring and selecting the right measures to use is the critical step. Again, another important point to emphasize here, and this goes back to the title of the presentation about the infinite mindset. If we use the wrong measures, it can cause a lot of unnecessary and unproductive effort with little benefit to your organization. And this is a, a sort of a personal experience for me. And I put this on as a reminder that I, I have personally witnessed HSE managers and directors spending a week, sometimes more of their time preparing reports for a board meeting that covers HSE or management of risk and the data gathering exercise is so labor intensive and really it's adding no value to preventing harm to people and, and ironically managing risk. So my question to that is, is to what end, right? What, what is the purpose of, of the board meeting? What level of assurance are we trying to give the report? And is it really healthy, someone in a senior position, having to spend a week of their time, possibly more, preparing information that really is not conducive to managing risk. But again, I'll, I'll elaborate more on that as we go through the session. 
So I've, I've put this additional slide in um, for people on the webinar who may come from different sectors and some guidance on what does good corporate governance look like? Well, the OECD guidance for senior leaders in high hazard industries, this is a great document for corporate governance for those who work in process safety. So this is a, a document that really elaborates on, you know, what sort of things should the board, should senior managers be looking for, for anybody who works in the process safety sector. And if I've done this right, hopefully when I've designed this presentation, when you click on these pictures, it should take you as hyperlinks to the actual documents themselves. And there's the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance, some really good information in that as well. It surprises me how many people, probably, you know, there might be a few on the call today, um, who aren't aware of this research report, 506, that was produced by the health and safety executive who have defined best practice in corporate governance and occupational health and safety. And it's a really good document that gives you a steer as to some of the sort of things your weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual reports should be looking at in terms of measuring performance. And then another document there, which is analysis of the HSE's communication of risk in the 21st century, and it's all linked with improving health and safety performance. Now, when you read these documents, which, which I have in a level of detail, the common thread that sits amongst all of them is that measuring performance requires balance. It requires balance both on leading and lagging indicators of risk. And, um, and it, gives, it, it provides some real good um, suggestions and advice with regards to what those leading and lagging indicators could look like. So given what I've just covered there with regards to leading and lagging indicators, we have to look and think, well, what have we created as risk and in the health and safety specific profession, what metrics have we, have we created? Well, I've just selected these at random and they're in the public domain. This is a, um, an end of year governance report from what I would class as a, a Fortune 500 or a, or a FTSE 50 type company. And if you look at that in terms of, this is the section on safety. So number of lost time injuries, total recordable injuries, hours worked, lost time injury frequency rate, total recordable injury rate, um, fatalities, permanent disability cases. So when you look at this and really scrutinize um, this particular document, there's nothing in it that real, really gives any governance with regards to how were these numbers achieved? Yeah. So you can you can certainly see trends, but all, all I'm seeing here is what's happened. I'm not seeing any warning signs of what may happen in the future. And and I one of the roles that I undertake, or two of them, I sit as a as a non-exec director on a couple of businesses, and I always challenge reports like this because I think, yep, that all looks very good, but what I want to know from a from a governance perspective and a an assurance feeling is, well, how did you achieve these figures? How were they actually achieved? And that's an end of year example. Business number two, this is an extract taken from a, um, a month end report. And again, it's not a particularly good graphic. I do apologize for that, but I'm sure many people on, on this call, this webinar, have seen similar sorts of graphs and, and statistics and all of these acronyms we've created, RIDOs, TRIR, AFR, all these lagging indicators of safety. Well, if nothing else, one of the takeaway thoughts from today is are these metrics which are used in many businesses for measuring risk, example, HSC performance, are they really adding the value that similar business metrics add, such as finance? Or have these things that we use just become normalized and expected? Let me be clear at this point, there's nothing wrong with metrics like this, but it needs balance. As we've already seen from the government's docu governance documents I've shared from what the health and safety executives suggest is we need to have balance to show and demonstrate that we've got real assurance that our risks are being controlled and managed. So 
if we think well what alternatives are there i don't know if anybody on the webinar has um, come across this sort of organization resilience engineering integrated operations a number of years and now they, they years ago now they coined a phrase that safety is not about the absence of negatives it's about the presence of capacities yeah what does that mean well in simple terms as i like to keep things managing risk effectively is not just simply about measuring failure yeah safety is not just about the absence of negatives it's about the presence of capacities so there's a gentleman that probably in the last five to ten years is almost on a personal crusade to try and change this thinking and again many people may have come across him for those who haven't this is professor sydney decker and he's a professor at griffith university in australia and he coined a phrase a number of years ago now about safety differently um and it was he, he captured that in what what i'd like to think i was doing we were doing at gauge solutions but he gave it a framework and he's written a number of books and some of the phrases that he's he's captured within them books if you look at the the field guide to understanding human error safety improvements come from organizations who monitor and understand the gap between the procedures and the practice underneath every simple obvious story about human error there is a deeper more complex story about the organization and then the bottom one there accidents are no longer accidents at all they are failures of risk management so if we understand that concept we understand why we're getting the zeros or the, the trends for our total recordable injury rates etc so it's not just about measuring failure safety is about what things we do well and things that go well and we need to capture that so if we we take that into a context then and look at a lot of organizations who have this this concept this target zero and um, and let me be clear from my own personal point of view here there is nothing wrong whatsoever with an aspiration of zero injuries it's healthy and anything else other than that would some would argue would be it's immoral yeah but when that healthy concern becomes an obsession then that can cause problems and in order to put a methodology together and and to put a process in place it's good to have some answers to some research well again you're more than welcome to look at this after the webinar this is a piece of research that was done in terms of arguing against the the, the health of having a vision zero as a statement and some of the things that were were, were said within the document was that despite the vision zero's moral appeal and its expansion throughout the world it's been criticized on many different grounds based on the findings researchers provided arguments against vision zero which can be identified into three major categories there's a moral argument arguments concerning the goal setting nature of vision zero often reinforced by reward and recognition and arguments aimed at the practical implementation of the goals and the research report which again is very easy to to find and it should be on the link if you click on this after the webinar but some of the findings um are listed here on this graphic um you'll see some hopefully flashing green ticks next to some of the very pertinent reasons as to why vision zero isn't particularly healthy again i'm not going to read all of these you'll see the one two the fourth one down it's slightly more bolded in the bigger font that accident statistics do not provide a reliable picture of the safety level within your organization the critics are right that the monthly yearly statistics on deaths and injuries do not inform us of the full picture and again you're more than welcome to look at this in further detail after today this is just a signposting document if you like to give you some ideas and thoughts so measure and performance link with mission zero or vision zero if you look at the and again all of these slides are referenced just quite subtle you'll see them in the bottom right hand corner this one's in the center there at the bottom zero harm if it's set as a goal it's an avoidance goal it's a goal where you're trying to avoid something 
rather than achieve something. Employees know that the goal success by the absence of something rather than the presence of something. Avoidance goals are not only positive, but are not inspirational. Avoidance goals tend to be punitive in nature. Often there's some kind of a, a punishment or negative reinforcement at the end of it. Performance goals are much more positive and successful. In the framework of understanding motivation and learning, leaders should be talking much more in cultural discourse about keeping people safe. And again, it's something I often see within the safety or risk community that, you know, it, it's this 45 years of creation of all these negative indicators. You know, this research suggests that, you know, why does the safety community think that avoidance goals are inspirational? In, in safety work based on vision zero, the degree of safety is measured and evaluated in terms of the number of fatalities and serious injuries that occur. And there's been a number of authors that have criticized this. So again, at your own leisure, you can see this for yourself with regard to the um, unhealthy links that some businesses have with vision zero. And none more so does this slide sort of um, really represent that. So I'm sure there's a number of people on the webinar today who will have heard about this a number of years ago now, the BP Transocean Deepwater Horizon um, oil platform, which exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, you could argue, was that incident a lack of leadership or was it a lack of governance and looking at the right things? Um, I'm sure many of you will have heard or read that literally a number of hours before that disaster, the vice president of drilling operations, Patrick O'Brien, was um, presenting an award for a number of years without a lost time incident. The real problem was that Deepwater Horizon, the disaster itself, was years in the making. BP and Transocean at that time had created a culture that had normalized behaviors and decision making. So this brought about what was called by the Chemical Safety Board an, an, an unavoidable tragedy, but rather what now is now termed a normal accident. A number of things had been normalized. So the term is product of normalized decisions by people who were following accepted practice and routines and lack of governance and management oversight to correct them. And it was only after the explosion that um, it became apparent there were a number of things that were wrong but certainly weren't being measured and reinforced. So in short, they were measuring the wrong things and were satisfied that the absence of incidents and accidents, that, that in itself was enough to satisfy them that risk was being well managed. So in terms of today's webinar, what we're trying to say is they were playing an infinite game with a finite mindset, yeah? So <clears throat> they were playing, they had a, an infinite mindset as opposed to a finite mindset, um, or other way around, beg your pardon. So what does that mean? Well, that's the background. That's the background. That's the history. We've talked a little bit about governance. We've talked so far about balance. We've talked about leading and lagging indicators. We, we've shown that nobody, including the regulator, thinks that good governance is just a report that shows a whole load of negatives. How many accidents, how many incidents? We've looked at where you know, the vision zero target can be criticized and can be, some feel, unhealthy based on the research. And when you look at vision zero moving from a target, a vision, an aspiration to, be, to an obsession, and then management or leaders within business get rewarded for measuring the wrong thing and achieving the wrong thing, that can become quite dangerous as I've just shown there, I tried to show with Deepwater Horizon. So, brings us to the finite and infinite game. When I was studying my, my research in my MBA about managing businesses and um, operating the business, I came across this these two gentlemen. Um, the one on the left-hand side is Professor James Cass, who in the late 80s, wrote a book and coined a fair phrase, the finite and infinite game. And he talked about the finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. 
Well, in more recent years, um, a motivational type leadership speaker, Simon Sinek, he's the author of the um, the book, The Infinite Game, um, particularly. So he talks predominantly about the infinite game. And he's also the author of another good book called Why. And what Simon suggests is, and this is purely based on, based on business, most leaders are playing the wrong game. When you play with a finite mindset in the infinite game of business, you lose trust, cooperation, innovation along the way. In contrast, infinite minded leaders create much stronger and competitive organizations. They even shape our future and leave behind resilient organizations and a legacy that lasts for generations. So when I was looking at this, studying my MBA, I thought long and hard about this. And I thought this, this concept this whole um, research piece and the whole application to business, it also applies to management of risk. Management of risk is not finite, it's infinite, it goes on, it goes on. So I thought, well, what would be useful today is to maybe describe what's the difference. First of all, some key terms. Again, I wasn't sure of the audience today, so I've tried to put some key terms and definitions. So infinite basically means without limits it has no end it has no boundaries as opposed to finite it has a definitive limit or it's a fixed size and both of them have got latin latin origins so again bear that in mind infinite without limits without end finite having a defined limit or a fixed size so in everyday life, how can we apply the infinite and finite game? Well, if you think about a finite game, an example of that would be football, cricket, basketball, passing an exam. They both have a beginning, a middle and an end. There's known players in the game, there's fixed rules and there's agreed upon objectives. And the outcome from the finite game is somebody wins and somebody loses. Now, at this point, I want to make it clear if you look down the left hand side column, you'll see football and cricket and basketball, then underneath passing an exam. Yeah. If you move across to the right, yeah, that is just a list. So it doesn't mean that no known players fix rules and agreed upon objectives just applies to passing an exam. It also applies to football, cricket, and basketball. So what I'm saying there in that table is football, cricket, basketball, passing an exam is a finite mindset it's a finite game it has a beginning a middle and an end there's known players there's fixed rules there's agreed upon objective and at the end of it you either win lose or you pass right that's when you play that game you're playing with a finite mindset conversely when you're playing an infinite game think about this yeah businesses in your sector construction manufacturing being a parent being a parent doesn't have, doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Being a parent goes on forever. Healthcare, you can't win at healthcare. You can't win at education. You can't win at marriage. All them things, you try to perpetuate the game for as long as you can. It goes on and on. And within, within infinite games, if you take something like the construction industry, the petrochemical industry, the... Uh, manufacturing industry, the banking industry, there are known and unknown players. There's no such thing as winning. The focus is on others. New players, new businesses can join at any time. You don't necessarily know who all the players are. For instance, I would challenge anybody on this call who works in construction to tell me the name of every single business, never mind in the world, in the UK. You don't know. The rules are changeable, meaning every player can play however they want. Yeah, the game never ends. The focus is on legacy. So when you've got an infinite mindset, the outcome is to perpetuate the game and stay in the game as long as you possibly can. So if we go back to, by definition, managing risk is an infinite game. Yeah. So at the end of the month, yeah, it doesn't stop. It goes on and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And the idea is to manage risk well forever, not to manage risk well for a month. 
There's no formal competition. There's no beginning, no middle, no end. It's a consistent, persistent, never-ending pursuit of ensuring the systems, the culture, the people that we have are effective and remain unharmed. So if you think about what happened with Deepwater Horizon, 11 people were killed, 17 people were injured. It was the worst environmental disaster in US history. BP were prosecuted. So the aftermath, Shell, Total, Conoco, Phillips, Perenco, Adno, none of them won anything. They can't claim to be the best at safety just because BP had an accident. There's no competition. And this is the bit that I think some people lose out on, lose, lose sight of. They simply keep operating. Those businesses just keep playing the game. Yeah? Incidents, businesses come and go. There's no such thing as winning at managing risks or winning in business. It doesn't exist. Yeah? It doesn't exist. So business leaders, HSE, risk management professional, for all those on the call, do you think that everybody fully understands what game they're playing? Certainly in my experience, the language of far too many leaders becomes abundantly clear that do not know what game they are playing. They talk about being number one at HSE. They talk about being the best at HSE. They talk about beating the competition with respect to HSE. My challenge to them is based on what? Show me where there's any agreed metrics in business for managing risk. There's guidance I've shown you earlier on from the health and safety executive, from the corporate governance document, but there's no competition. So it amazes me when you have leaders in businesses playing an infinite game with a finite mindset, yeah? Saying they're gonna be number one when there is no competition, yeah? So it, again, you know, this is something for people on the call to think about. There's nothing wrong with one to try and be really good and really proficient at managing risk, but to claim you're the best or to claim you're world-class, I often challenge that because th there is no competition to say, well, what's world-class based upon? So in terms of gauge solutions, I always challenge some of our HSE managers, some of the C-suite executives who claim the number one in their sector. They might be very good. They might be lead in their sector. And all I'll say to them is, yeah, for now, for now, but in six months time, will you still be number one? You know, you're playing the long game, not the short game. So the real challenge then, when you're building your infinite mindset type of a culture. So if you have a finite mindset, this for me and the research suggests it's where it's a culture that damages the business and many of the people and focuses on short term benefits in the name of short term gains. It's a HSE culture that in many businesses sucks the life out of many of the great people who work there. There is sufficient, more than ample evidence to suggest that it will eventually come at a much deeper cost in terms of workplace incidents, commitment, loyalty, and employees wanting to do the right thing as having to do the right thing, yeah? Big difference. But an infinite mindset, it's this concept of building a company, HSE culture, that can survive every single person on this webinar today after we've all long gone and that remains true to its purpose that's a very powerful thing is that aspiration essential well it depends on what kind of culture every single person on this webinar wants to sustain if you want a company that can continue to innovate and set the course for what risk management should look like and define more importantly, what innovation looks like in your sector, long after we're all gone, then I would say build that culture. Build a culture with an infinite mindset, not a finite mindset. So building that culture then. When we play with a finite mindset in an infinite game and we play to win in a game that has no finish line, then there are some really consistent and predictable outcomes. There becomes a decline in trust a decline of cooperation, a decline of innovation. Again, all those on the webinar today, you all don't know, I would challenge anybody to tell me every other company in construction, power, manufacturing, oil, gas, petrochemical, banking, waste and recycling sector. Yeah, there's small ones, there's large ones, you don't know them all. 
and many HSE risk professionals in any of these sectors can join at any time. They can run their department procedures however they want. There is no set way. Some companies like flowcharts, some companies prefer procedures that are very wordy. They can do whatever they want. Nobody wins at risk management as it's not finite. It does not have a beginning, middle and end. It simply repeats and repeats. The series of repeating a finite game <coughs> doesn't make it infinite. It just makes you exhausted. Yeah, It's a different mindset. This is a problem <coughs> because when we play with this finite mindset in an infinite game, it can damage culture. So when we bring this all together then, what, what should we be measuring? What sort of things for an infinite game? Well, we often see what happens in governance. <coughs> Businesses, as I've already tried to explain, they play to win when they should be governing. Because when you play to win, it can hurt the whole system. Businesses often overuse sports analogies in business. I, I hear this very regularly. <coughs> the problem is, is that sport, excuse me one second, sport is always a finite game example running to win a marathon you've got mile markers to know how far how fast you've gone and that's the same as monthly safety statistics but they don't constitute the end of the game they are just markers markers that's all they are a better an analogy to use when thinking of risk management is example i want to be a better person who lives a healthy lifestyle so okay what are all the things I need to do and measure myself against consistently? Well, I need to eat well. I need to exercise well. I need to manage my personal relationships. And then once I've mastered the art of that, I need to perpetuate it over and over again. And it's a real challenge to do all of these things all the time. It's a pursuit and an aspiration. So applying that concept then to risk management, what do we need in place to, in order to manage risk well? Well, for a start, we need great inspirational leadership. And I've got a quote here from the US Marine Academy, which I personally think it's superb because I, I've seen this in my 30 year career. Good leaders sometimes suffer mission failure. Bad leaders sometimes enjoy mission success. What they're looking for in the US Marine Corps is they're looking for the qualities that make someone a good leader. And if they, if they select the people that exhibit those qualities of good leadership, they know that over the course of time, those people will, will enjoy more success than not. And that's where it starts in any organization. Then you need great people with high levels of commitment. You need great systems of work. You need great corporate oversight. You need great communications. You need great support functions, HSE, HR, training, and the list goes on. The challenge is, how do you measure all of that to see how effective it is? So when you look at measuring, we all measure goals, we set goals, and often goals that are set are quite arbitrary. Um, and, and again, this is often used when, we, when businesses set HSE performance and get it, get it wrong. I've found that so many businesses are good at measuring the wrong things and then they reward people for them. So, you know, I've heard, you know, we want to hit this number on this date. We want to reduce our accident frequency rate by 10% by quarter four. Somebody just made that up, literally. It's very rarely I see any science applied to some of these. And if there are some people on the call who do apply science and data analysis and use big data to come up with this, well, I commend you. Yeah, it's brilliant, but it's not the norm. In fact, quite often, someone will even say, I think we can do better than that. And someone says, you're right, here's the new HSE goals. And it's usually within 12 months because that's when bonuses get paid. So these are the typical sorts of scenarios. So if we take that back to a healthy lifestyle analogy, if you're trying to lose X amount of weight by such a date, it's often an arbitrary number and an arbitrary date, yeah? I'm going to lose, I don't know, 10 pounds by, by the summer. Yeah, you hit the goals, you're related, but then what? The problem is the game's not over. You have to keep it up and keep exercising the rest of your life. 
hitting a goal means nothing if you're wanting a really healthy lifestyle. What you need to understand is how did you achieve that goal? What happens if you miss the goal? Well, you're probably much healthier than when you started your venture. You just picked the wrong number and the wrong date. And perhaps in a year and a half, you'll hit the weight that you want. And you can see it from the trend data. You're heading in the right direction. Yeah. So how did you achieve your goal is much more important when you're playing the infinite game. So this is what we mean when we're managing risk and managing performance. The absolute end game of managing risk is finite, which is zero. But it is the trends on how we get there that are infinite. If I have two teams and I simply bonus employees on one factor and one factor alone, which is, did you hit your accident frequency rate? Did you hit your TRIR on the date? What you could end up, and I've had personal experience of this, some leaders who decide to change the data at the last minute to suit them, some leaders who threaten people, some leaders who cover up incidents, manipulate the figures. I see so many businesses spending so much time on deciding, is this a riddle? Yeah, is this a riddle? Because they're trying to avoid reporting it because Sydney Decker, back to Sydney, he would argue they're trying to um, you know, manipulate their looking good index. Yeah, so it's damaging. And then people who achieve this, the track like heroes and receive the bonus. So this sends out a message to the rest of the company that we don't care how we achieve the numbers, we will reward you for it regardless. And over the course of time, this has a real negative impact on culture. Alternatively, measuring performance, what about having a team that has an amazing culture? Nobody quits, nobody lies. It's fair and just, a just and fair culture. The morale is high. You see trend data that show improvements steady improvements not roller coasters where we're having an initiative on near misreporting and suddenly it goes up then it goes down again and you know a roller coaster kind of a graph what if that team missed their numbers you know if they don't hit the target quite often they don't get any bonus they're given nothing not even praise sometimes even chastised over it wouldn't it be great if we could have loads of positive reinforcement to that team suggesting that you know it's great you're going to hit your goals eventually you get in there there's clear improvement do it apologies for the typo there doing this businesses will recognize the importance of trend data and understand how they achieve their metrics not just the fact that they supposedly met them wouldn't that be a great culture this is an infinite mindset yeah this is what i'm talking about the infinite mindset about how it's perpetuated. So just to finish up with then, I've given you the, the sort of background. I hope that's helped. We've talked about governance. We've talked about expectations. We've talked about what's been created over the years and how research suggests that could be argued is unhealthy to have the zero concept, to have that finite mindset, a balance leading and lagging indicators and having that mindset of, of improvement rather than obsession with perfection. Well, I'll take you back to the research report 506 and some of the key points that have come out for that. And as I go through some of these, perhaps have a think about whether your organization is doing this or not. So the board should set out the key objectives and targets on OHS balancing leading and lagging indicators and capturing the tangible and intangible factors, yeah? No single measure provides an overriding indication of success or failure. It's the board's responsibility to establish the performance framework with which the business operates. This framework should include setting objectives and targets to meet the overall vision of what the company is trying to achieve. What is deemed appropriate will vary with the type and culture of the organization and should always be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Undesirable and potentially conflictive incentives should be avoided within any remuneration and performance management system. Yeah, that might be giving some people food for thought. 
targeting and incentivizing on numbers of accidents and incidents may lead to a culture of hiding incidents and failing to report them rather than reducing actual numbers of incidents reliance on data alone for example of the ones i've said there has the following drawbacks it's beset with problems of underreporting. it does not measure non-injury health and safety failures it's beset with problems of statistical significance such as small numbers there is no automatic link pardon me between lost time accident performance and major hazard safety similarly there's no link between lost time accident performance and levels of psychological safety and mental health and well-being which is a whole new concept and construct that's sort of manifested in the last few years so rosper has argued that a more holistic approach to performance assessment is required based on an assembly of portfolio of leading indicators such as measures of your culture measures of the integrity and performance management systems and lagging indicators yeah so all of that which i've taken the main points from are all embedded within that document and it's the research done by the health and safety executive so a practical thing for you to think about and this is something we encourage with a lot of our clients when we engage with cultural change organizational behavior behavioral based safety programs we talk about something that I'd like you all to consider on the webinar today. And that is something called a combined performance matrix or a balanced scorecard. And I've tried to put a very brief example on here. So all it kind of shows is that if you've got a topic, we've got leading and lagging indicators, and th th this could be a balanced scorecard of about 10 or 20 things. I'm just using two leading and two lagging indicators here. And what I've tried to demonstrate is so if we take risk assessment reviews and we're saying 100 percent of our risk assessments should be reviewed this month close out of corrective actions by their close out date the target is 100 percent riddles the target is zero first aid is zero then if you look at the lagging indicators if you actually achieve your zero yeah well if this balanced scorecard adds up to 100 percent each one of those four areas is worth 25 percent so for the bottom part of the scorecard you've scored 50 percent because you achieved your objective but in this particular example if only 25 percent of the risk assessments were reviewed well for 25 percent on that particular construct or objective you'd only score 6.5 percent and if you've only closed out 75 percent of your corrective actions that will give 18.75%. So when you add it all up, as that example, as small as it is, that would say that that site, that business was 75% safe in terms of measuring performance this month. And the way you would use this scorecard is rather than having a target, going back to saying, do you think you could achieve 76% next month, then 78, then 79, then 80, then 85, and over the months and over a six month period, you'll see hopefully a steady increase in how you are managing those leaders indicators of safety. And when you get to a point where every month it's 100 percent, you can take out them proactive indicators, put five, five, six, 10, 20 new ones in, whatever you want, and challenge yourself again, knowing the scorecard's going to drop. And then you try again to improve. And what that does, it demonstrates that on a monthly basis, yes, we can show our board of directors that our TRIR, our AFR, our LTI rate is in a, in a um, it's heading in the right direction, but we can also supplement that with the how we've achieved it. And quite often that is what's missing from reports because people are often using finite thinking in an infinite game of risk management so again just to finish the bottom part there's traditional metrics easy to measure lagging indicators and then the top bit is new metrics that sit alongside traditional metrics that offer a balance and provide the overall how so on that i think i'm about on time i've tried to allow a few minutes if there are any questions 
thank you very much for listening. I hope it's made some sort of sense and uh, you've now got a better sort of view or opinion on what infinite thinking is as opposed to finite thinking and understanding that risk management is most definitely not a finite game. It doesn't end. It goes on and we try to perpetuate the things that we do well and constantly evolve in the infinite game of risk management. Thank you all very much. Over to you, Jonathan, Julie. Great. Thank you for a fantastic pleasant, blah, 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 put my teeth in presentation, Glenn. And we do have a question. It's quite a long one, so I'll try and do my best to read it properly. Where okay. Sydney Decker suggests all accidents are a failure in systems. Do you think this implies that all systems are predicated on a target zero mindset? Or do you mm -hmm. think that resilience and capacity to manage unintended outcomes should be factored into systems to accept that accidents will occur and so measures need to be in place to mitigate the severity of an adverse outcome that's from mike right i think the simple <laughs> answer is yes <laughs> I, I, I think I, I think um in terms of resilience engineering and and trying um to say that everything is, is a systemic failing. Um, I actually think there is research out there that would suggest that, um, you know, not, not everything is a systemic failing. There are, there are elements of human factors where, um, you know, it, it could be down to, to an individual, individual circumstances. Um, but in answer to the question, yes, there should be more things built into processes that try to take into account. I mean, if this is such a, a really good question, I mean, it takes into account all aspects of psychological safety, people's mental health and well-being, and and you can't. You, it's very difficult to say that everything in business, if something was to happen, an incident or an accident, is a systemic failing. What we've got to look at is is the whole person approach to safety, and think about you know how much effort do we put into people's well-being, the mental health, their personal circumstances. And th that's a challenge. And, and that, that the sort of question that's just been asked there is without doubt infinite thinking. How do we put those, those challenging metrics in place to take them things into account rather than thinking, well, something's just happened and that's impacted on our statistics at the end of the, end of the month, end of the year. So I think the short answer to that, I'm fairly convinced on it, is is yes, there should be more effort put into systemic thinking and resilience to take into account the whole person approach to safety as well as the systems. Great, thank you. Um, I had a number of comments. Hello, thanks for a valuable webinar. Great webinar. Thanks for the presentation today. Um, mm -hmm. Just to clarify, we will let people, I will email um, Glenn's presentation tomorrow. So that's it so far. Jonathan, do you have any questions for Glenn? Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a couple of things actually which I was going to uh, going to mention. Um, some comments and some questions. To be honest, uh, I think right at the very beginning when you when you, when you talked about the the wrong measures uh, and the questions that, that you asked to kind of boards in sort of non exec um, positions that you go is that. Uh, I do something similar, but almost uh, kind of saying, so what? So you've got all these measures that you, you take to the board and you talk about and you discuss, and, and, and I use the simple word, just so, so what, right? You've given that information across to a, a board member or to a, a, an executive committee. What are they supposed to feel when they sit there getting that information and that data? Does that give them a warm, fuzzy feeling, or does it give them that um, chronic unease type, right? what do we want them to do with that information which we've just passed across uh, and conveyed? Um, and I think that's, that's as we get to the, the, the conclusions to the session, what I took away is, is some of the, hopefully, some of the answers that delegates can take away for themselves to factor into their, their indicators is what is the, receiver of that information going to take away from it. Um, and that's quite interesting. Uh, more of a, a confirmation for people who are attending the webinar that when we 
uh, or when you talk about process safety, uh, that, you know, it, do you believe process safety principles can be applied to non-process driven operations? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think absolutely they can. I think some of the principles can. I mean, um, obviously being a, uh, an engineer, an aircraft engineer, with my own background, specialising in human factors, um, the, the you know the 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 two in aircraft engineering, process safety and occupational safety are indelibly indelibly linked with one another. In terms of um, you know the, there's there's a lot of um, you know in terms of process safety risk normalisation, you know you can link that very nicely with situational awareness. So if you if you have a if you have a, a, a pipe that's got a valve that's passing steam, you know, in the process safety sector, you know, people get very worried about, you know, people walking past that and not reporting it and because suddenly things become normalized and normalized behavior is very different because if everybody thinks somebody else has reported that steam leak, then suddenly you could end up with a, a situation whereby you know everyone thinks it's going to be repaired and it isn't so that that there's an element of that around situational awareness and being aware of your surroundings and not just looking but but seeing and to me that's no different to when somebody is starting to work on erecting a scaffold or the the um the parking up a vehicle you know have you parked up a vehicle right next to a pothole so that when you and it wouldn't be the first time this has happened somebody gets out of a vehicle and they're, they're spraying their ankle because they haven't been situationally aware or if somebody's working and there's somebody above them could something could, you know could something drop on the head and and i think to be fair some of the principles of process safety um and and taking that that time out to really look and and delve you know have, have been introduced for things such as a power a take two, a take time risk assessment. And I also think that, you know, the metrics you can use, um, you know, can there'd have to be some thought around it, but it can absolutely be done, but only to a degree, I think, Jonathan. I think it can be done, but 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 it will have limits. Brilliant. Well, thanks for that, Glenn. And no the last kind of question from me was is that there was loads loads and loads to take away and to think about and, and thank you for kind of hyperlinking the sort of documents and reference material for those that have logged on to, to go away and, and kind of take a look at a lot of the research documents i know there's a few there which i'm going to be taking a look at but if there was one takeaway that you could say to everyone who's attending and everyone who may um then listen back when when this gets published on the youtube channel what one thing could they go back into their workplace, you know, tomorrow and start getting a, a bit of a, a bang for their buck or, or a bit of a, a pick start with this mindset? Uh, what kind of takeaway would you most bring to tell them? I, I, I would say the takeaway for me is don't obsess over perfection and take for granted improvement. I, I think I think um, perfection and, a, and an aspiration to achieve zero harm, zero is fine. But I, I think for it to turn from a healthy aspiration to an obsession becomes unhealthy. And, and I'm for a culture of never ever taking good people for granted and make sure that there's an engendered culture of positive reinforcement and, and never ever taking improvement um, and good people who do a good job for granted. And, and I think that if, if that if that's done and it's done sincerely in a non-patronizing way, that one thing, I mean, there's many, but you asked me one thing, that one thing for me is so important. We should never ever take for granted um, any steps in the right direction um, at the risk of, of just obsessing with zero. Um, I think it's so important. I think it was on about the the third from the last slide about what what you would do with a good team where the trends are showing that um, everything's heading in the right direction. Yes, they might have an off day, 
but quite you know quite often I see that off day being noted and there isn't enough fuss made about or positive reinforcement made about the trend generally is going like that and it, it's it I see it in so many businesses whereby um, that positive reinforcement doesn't happen and we always work as you know Jonathan uh, on a on a ratio and I know some people would debate this but it's very simple it's four to one I'm a big believer in organizations where there truly is a good culture people experience four times as much positive feedback as they do to the one where there's room for improvement no brilliant no absolutely agree yeah the four to one ratio I do remember that well I think that's yeah. a, a great takeaway for people to to take back uh, and look at starting to to implement ever so simple yeah. and well worth doing look um thanks Glenn that was that was everything all the questions that that I had uh, I think right. one last uh, plug to those who've dialed in next branch meeting is the 21st of February again that one is machinery safety we've got a, a chap coming to talk to us about pure and some simple solutions that we can apply to pure and our next one after that is uh we can find as the 29th of march where we're looking at fire legislation and a final reminder third of feb deadline for getting your risk excellence awards in the opportunity to get uh, a nomination for a team or an individual uh, again glenn is one of the judges on this year's panel and um I'm sure we're looking forward to receiving all of those. I'll uh, hand back over to you, Julie, if there's any final thoughts or, or Tony as our chair. Just a quick question, Jonathan, quickly. Uh, I think people must be typing off that business card at the bottom there. I've had five requests in already for the slides. Can, can, I, can I just make sure that everyone is aware that I, I would prefer them to go through Julie. If that, I'm not being negative, but it's uh, I'd rather them go through Julie than me send them out just ad hoc. Is that all right? Yeah, I'll make sure I email them to everybody tomorrow. Oh, great. And I just want to take the opportunity, Glenn, to uh, thank you on what was a most thought-provoking presentation, because you actually covered there, certainly in the early stages, some of the guidance documentation that I have to confess, after all these years, I wasn't even aware of. Um, and I think it's useful in the fact that it's been hyperlinked and it gives people a good takeaway and gives them perhaps an alternative way of looking at how they manage a business moving forward, as opposed to the traditional use of perhaps relying on things such as ISO standards. And I think it's beneficial in the fact that you may be able to integrate a number of documents um, that will drive the business process forward so you know once again from you know on behalf of the east anglian branch i thank you very much for your presentation tonight absolute pleasure you're very welcome as are all the members and the people on the call thank you great thank you for giving up your valuable time glenn we really do appreciate it and thank you for the east anglia branch committee who volunteer your time to organize these webinars for members so i'd like to wish everyone a good evening and i hope to see you at the next branch webinar good night everyone good night thank you very much